if you um, if you go chasing something from the real, the, those who desire it the most will be the ones least likely to get hold of it. So the story goes that in early uh, July 1947, and the dates do vary. Sometimes it's second, sometimes it's the 4th of July, all out to the 6th, I think. Uh, a flying saucer allegedly crashed in in the uh, ranching country north of uh, Roswell in New Mexico. Uh, the first the world heard of this uh, earth-shattering event was through the very official source of the U.S. Army Air Force, and a press release was, was given out which um, spelled it out quite explicitly. And this is, of course, reprinted in just about every book on UFOs, but I will read it to you now as well. So, Roswell Army Air Force Base, Roswell, New Mexico, 8th of July, 1947. The many rumours regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence officer of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone facilities, the rancher stored the disc until such a time he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Action was immediately taken and the, the disc was, t was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. The thing is, straight after this release was, was given to the press, um, the Air Force came back with a, a complete refutation and denial of, of the story. And surprisingly enough, the world believed it at the time, and the Roswell incident was more or less forgotten for about 30 years until ufologists went back to the town in the late 70s and started interviewing the, the, the original witnesses. Now, I use that term witness here uh, advisedly because um, none of the major players in the, in the story actually saw a UFO or a flying saucer, or an alien, or anything like that. The, the rancher on whose property the debris was collected, not, not a saucer, I'll get to that in a second, uh, his name was William Mac Brazel. Um, yeah, he didn't find an intact spaceship of any sort. He just found uh, part of his, one of his paddocks strewn with um, bits of balsa wood and tin foil, is how it was described. Just nothing that would have been out of, out of place in a trash heap. And the Air Force intelligence officer who was in charge of the salvage mission, that's Jesse A. Marcel, um, he never saw a flying saucer either. This was something that he was adamant about until his dying day, despite the ufologists coming back and questioning and questioning. He never fully said what he, that it was a UFO or extraterrestrial or anything. He just said he didn't know what it was, which is probably the truest thing anyone said in the whole story. But another witness who didn't see anything either in the Roswell story was the, uh, the public information officer at the Army Air Force Base who uh, was called Lieutenant Walter Hort. Um, and as it turns out, I met, I met Walter Hort back in Roswell in 2002 when I went there to do some research. He was, by that stage, um, in his early 80s and was director of the International UFO Museum and Research Centre. Um, I, I think my interview with him must have been one of his last because he, he, he passed away about three years after that. His health had been ha failing for a while, I think. Um, but despite his obvious commitment to ufology, I mean, he was running this, this museum that had a, a real fake alien autopsy in, as one of its exhibits. Um, despite this commitment of, of his, he couldn't really tell me anything about the, the Roswell crash. Um, and that's because he wasn't there. He didn't see anything. And I, I recall feeling this very strong sense of futility as I was asking him questions and, and he was a very friendly guy, very dignified, but there was just nothing there. So I'll just read that bit too from the book because it's my sort of defining experience of being in Roswell. An hour had passed and Hort, who had a, who had a guess was five times my age, make that a bad guess, was showing signs of tiring. His stories devolved into rambling accounts of his adventures as an enlisted man Memories for which he clearly showed much more nostalgia than an unproven flying saucer crash that he personally had little to do with. The Roswell incident was just a passing moment in Hort's life. It struck me that his present commitment to ufology was something picked up later in his life when he was trying to make sense of his personal involvement in this highly strange epic. The Roswell incident was an event he was still trying to remember, not because of senility, you understand, 
but because he literally hadn't been there, the truth of the Roswell incident was almost as far removed from Hort as it was from myself. So finally, in that week that I stayed at Roswell, I decided I'd go out to the official crash site, which is um, maybe about an hour's drive north of the town, uh, close to, to another town called Corona. Um, but I turned back maybe halfway there because all the stories people have been telling me was that there's nothing there to see. It's just an empty field. Again, this empty space that means nothing and somehow has been made part of this, this huge saga. So I didn't, I didn't go and I don't think I missed, it, missed out on anything there. But this, this whole emptiness in, in Roswell, this for me is the problem with UFOs in general that they barely exist when they're stirring even in their own stories. So where does a UFO uh, appear in the Roswell saga? I mean, if by UFO you're talking about an extraterrestrial spacecraft, then the answer is it doesn't appear, except in these conspiracy theories that have been made retroactively by ufologists to explain this, this absence of any actual story. Although some witnesses say they saw a bright disk flashing through the sky early in, in uh, July 947, there's nothing to connect that to that debris in the field. There's nothing to connect that to crashed flying saucers. Nobody saw the crash itself. Strictly speaking, there's no flying saucer in this story at all. Just that debris collected from the field, which stand out as inert pieces of a, of a reality that don't make any sense in this story and don't make any sense to me either. So when I say that there's no saucer in the Roswell story, I don't, mess, I don't actually necessarily mean that maybe one wasn't recovered and, and that the, the Kevlar body armour and night vision is being used by American soldiers in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan right now are, are based on, on something recovered from that, that source and maybe it happened. I don't know. I don't think so. But what I'm trying to say is that right from the beginning in the Roswell saga, the thing that everybody is arguing and fighting about, the UFO itself, has never really existed in a symbolic sense. It's a gap in the story, a vacant exhibit in, the, in that museum on, on Main Street, an empty field out in the sagebrush country. The Roswell UFO doesn't exist, but it is real, and that's the problem with it. 